Thank you very much. 
I remember growing up on the PNM and DLP. Right up the PNM and UNC. And these boys can't solve out the problem yet. They can't solve out the problem yet. I personally find it's insulting. Insulting. You see, differences. There will always be. So, partner, you could be you. I could be me. But then that's the damn thing self that makes this country sweet. Partner, bring your drum. Let me start to be. Don't mind the politics, 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 and when the pala tricky, pala tricky, pala tricky, pala tricky, send you with That's why we jamming on, we jamming on, we jamming on them, cause we know the story. So let them fight them the one in the stand of the deep world glory. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. See how we move it, watch how we groove it, see how we flow this sky. One lovely nation. On Thank you very much. I remember growing up on the PNM and DLP. Right up the PNM and UNC. And these boys can't solve all the problem yet. They can't solve all the problem yet. I personally find it's insulting. Insulting. You see, differences, there will always be. So, partner, you could be you, I could be me. But then that's the damn thing self that makes this country sweet. Partner, bring your drum. Let me start to be. Don't mind the politics, 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 And when the politics, 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 it's a situation. That's why we jamming on, we jamming on, we jamming on them, cause we know the story. So let them fight them the one in the stand of the deep world glory. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. See how we move it, watch how we groove it, see how we flow this time. One lovely nation under a group. We got this done in the night. Welcome to Politics 101. I tell you, they can never get Calypso in Calcutta. Can't come from there. <coughs> they can never get Calypso in Dar es Salaam. It can't come from there. No, the origins of the Calypso is in Africa. But the Calypso, as we know it, has to be West Indian. Has to be West Indian. You see, in Dar es Salaam, they didn't... They didn't experience the Middle Passage. They didn't experience the Middle Passage. You see, in Calcutta, they didn't experience the Middle Passage. The Ganges, commit the Nile. My brother, David Michael Rudder, we call him royalty in Calypso, King David. The poet, philosopher of Calypso. David Michael Rudder. Ah, differences, there will always be. Partner, you be you. And me be me. You see, many of us want a multiracial Guyana, eh? But, but, but we, we disagree on what is multiracial. 
A multiracial Guyana for me is a Guyana where you be you and me be me. Some people want us to stop being Africans and stop being Indians and stop being Chinese and stop being Portuguese. You know, in their head, a Guyana cannot be part Portuguese, part Amerindian, part Chinese, part Guyanese, part Indian. A Guyana for them is something out there floating in the sky. But my Guyana is David Rudder's Guyana. You be you, me be me, and that is the damn thing that make us sweet. I tell you all the other day, it's only a Guyanese, a West Indian. Could lash up some dal and rice at 10 o'clock? Lash up some cook up at 2 o'clock? Eat some bacon salfish at 6 o'clock and washing down with some 8-year-old or some ginger beer or some sarin, and it don't upset the stomach. <laughs> you know? Some people, when they mix up the thing, you upset the stomach. No, we Guyanese and West Indian, we have a particular kind of stomach. The greatest music ever, the Calypso. It does what other music does, but it does what no other music does. Are you hearing me good? This is high-class philosophy. <laughs> I have a partner, a, 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 a colleague named Rohit Kanai. He would ask me, so David, what do you mean when you say the Calypso can only come from Guyana in the Caribbean? <laughs> yes, yes. Rohit, well, <laughs> because of the unique experience, the unique experience. Good evening to you all and welcome to Politics 101, Politics 101. As I said last night or whenever, Tendulkar could come from the Caribbean. Kohli could come from the Caribbean. But Rohan Kanai and Alvin Kalicharan can only come from the Caribbean. Can come from India. In the same way, Buvana, the black South African captain, he could conceivably come from the Caribbean. He could have conceivably come from St. Kitts and Nevis or Guyana. But Brian Lara and Shimran Etmaya can only come from the Caribbean. So Vivian Richards could only come from Antigua, Barbuda, and the Caribbean. Can't come. Can't come from Kenya. He's African. But he's African West Indian. Good evening. Welcome to Politics 101. That's the damned himself. That's what makes us unique. That's, that's what makes us unique. Walter Rodney went to Africa. He spent five to six years there, 69 to 74, but he was there sometime before. And he, he changed how history, the history of Africa is written. He's probably better known in Africa than he is, or put it another way, he's probably better appreciated in Africa than he is in the Caribbean. But Walter Rodney could only come from the Caribbean. And he tells the story of how he became an African historian. His first year at university in, in the West Indies and in Mona, they had to write an essay, one on Africa and one on the Caribbean. He found he could write about the Caribbean, but he couldn't write about Africa. And so he decided that he's going to study African history. And he took the Guyanese West Indian gaze to African history. The rest is history. 
how Europe on the develop Africa change the way African history has been told since. Oh yes, only in Guyana and the Caribbean. We are African people, we are Indian people, we are Chinese, we are Portuguese. Some of us mix up with one or two or more. We are Amerindian. But we are totally Guyanese and West Indian. Professor Resnettiford calls it chaos in order and order in chaos. Only we could understand that. I was talking last night, you know, only a Guyanese or West Indian would say, I put a song views in on she, a song views in. I put a good cussing out on she, good cussing out, song views in. We contextualize the cussing out and the views in. And we make a distinction between abusing and cussing out as reasoning and abusing and cussing out like what was past Thursday at Congress Place. Not Congress Place, um, Freedom House. Good evening. Welcome to Politics 101. David Hines here. Um, the Ganges has met the Nile. Ganges made the Nile. David Michael Rudder, as uh, cited here last night by by a uh, member of parliament, Amanza Walton De Zero, we learn, is a student of the Calypso. And she cited Ganges as Met the Nile by David Rudder and Jahaji Bai by Brother Marvin. We're going to play Jahaji Bai, um, Jahaji Bai tomorrow. Um, tonight, we jam on the Ganges as Met the Nile. David Michael Rudder, um, the poet philosopher of Calypso. The poet philosopher. This Irie, Irie Trinidad, when the ball is cover. That is Irie, Irie Trinidad, when you be the lover. And she hugged them up and said, Come on, be my little sister. And life became the carnival of a brand new culture. If I push up your hand, if you want to start now. See how we move it, watch how we move it, see how we flow and stand. Oh yes, one lovely nation under a group, the parties can be denied. Here we go. Them boys with the hidden agendas and the mindbenders, we will always do their through. But now that we hold it hand Turning to the promised land, then them will come along too. Cause we move in with our power and glory. See how we float in the sky. Oh, yes, one lovely nation heading to salvation. We can teach them the night. Thank you very much, God bless you. Michael Rudder, they can't please any man. Huh? I I remember growing up on the PNM and DLP, right up the PNM and UNC, and these boys can't solve all the problem yet. They can't solve all the problem yet. I personally find it's insulting, insulting. You see, differences, there will always be. So partner, you could be you, I could be me. But then that's the damn thing self that makes this country sweet. Partner, bring your drum. Let me start to be. Don't mind the politics, 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 polit
jamming and be jamming and be jamming on them because we know the story. So let them fight them the one in the stand up and be worth glory. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. See how we move. You know, I play that back because I want you all to understand. There can be no Guyana without African Guyanese or Indian Guyanese and Chinese and Amerindian and Portuguese and, and Europeans. That's what make us Guyanese. So when people tell you they want a Guyana without the Afro and the Indo and the Amerindians, what they're talking to you about is about one group dominating. When you hear an Indian man tell you, let me forget about the Afro and the Indo, what he's saying is me, Indo, must become Guyana. And when an African tell you, don't, don't let me worry about no Afro and no Indo, he want he Afro to become Guyana. David Rudder, Guyana, and Trinidad is what I want and what I am proposing to you all you be you me be me and it's you me does make up we wonderful to be a Guyanese wonderful to be West Indian wonderful to be African and wonderful to be a radical revolutionary even in 2024 because we are still doing it Radicals and revolutionaries are still doing it. I said last night, in any government going forward, we radicals want to be at the table. We want to be at the, the table to deliver to you certain things that only can be, live, be delivered to you when we are at the table. Cash transfers, a universal basic income, where monies from our oil well go directly to you. Only we radicals can deliver that to you. We got to be at the table. Even if you find a 5% space, a 10% space, we, we can be at that table. When we radicals are at the table, there's no question about teachers' wages. There's no question about that. That is front and center. Because we are talking about the total emancipation of our education system. That's what we're talking about. And teachers' wages have to be there. And 50% illiteracy got to go. Got to go. We are declaring an emergency in education. By radical, we mean we're going to the roots. We're not tap tapping. The University of Guyana has to be a mecca for education in the Caribbean. That's why we radicals have to be at the table. Because there are certain things only we can deliver. The Ganges must meet the Nile and all of us must sit down there and determine what our Guyana must look like. What our Guyana must look like. Welcome to Politics 101. Uh, the teachers, and the government met today. And you know, I make it very clear where I stand. Make it very clear what where I stand. I said this thing can only be the teachers winning. It can only be the teachers winning. It can be nothing else. The government didn't want to go to the table. They are now at the table. The teachers wanted us to go to the table. We are now at the table. Who win? Who win? The latest news today is that the teachers union, the education ministry agreed to multi-year period for salary hikes. Top officials of the Guyana Teachers Union and the Ministry of Education on Thursday ended fruitful talks with the employer agreeing to consider proposed salary increases from 2019 to 2023. GTU President Dr. Mark Light said the union succeeded in getting the government side to back down from its position that the multi-year agreement should begin from 2024. 
You all hear that? The government wanted to start talking from 2024. The teachers said from 2019. What they agree, agree on finally? 2009. Who win? Who win? Somebody the other morning said when we talk about who win and who lose, don't, 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 don't talk based on, uh, what was the term the brother used? He said, you know, we mustn't talk based on uh, emotions. I think that's the term he used. The fact of the matter. The government today wanted the multi-year agreement to start from 2024. The teachers wanted to start from 2019. What they agreed to? 2019. Who win? The teachers. Already you, the union president said that his side would not be settling for single digit increases. We are not going to accept single digits. Pim, pim. Brother Light can only say that when he's at the table. He went on to say that the two sides also decided that instead of terms of reference, they would be signed minutes at the end of each meeting. That becomes a binding arrangement at the end of every session. Dr. Light said he was a little bit more positive Thursday afternoon in contrast to the serious disagreements about the multi-year agreement. You see, we, 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 we always have to measure things our way. I think some of us were too quick to say the teachers lose because that's what the other side is saying, the teachers lose. And I understand why many of us said these teachers lose, because we have lost confidence in the institutions. The teachers said 2019, the government said 2024. At the end of the day, the ink, the signature to what to 2019. Who win? You see victories are not always the total victory. You win victories as you go along the way. You get them to come to the table and sit down when they didn't want to come to the table and sit down. You get the court to come in and do something like courts don't normally do. In a sense, the teachers liberate the court. Now that they agree to sit down, Many of us were concerned that there was a thing in there say the thing must be settled in reasonable time. And we were saying, oh God, reasonable can mean next year. Well, reasonable will be defined in real time. The first day of talks today, the day after the teachers went back to school, the teachers already win a big victory. And they're going to continue on Tuesday morning at 9.30. I know sometimes when you get a lot of beating up, you tend to become cynical and you don't believe you can win anything. And even when you're winning, you're not really recognizing how big you're winning. And I know sometimes we are radicals and radicals like total transformation immediately. But as I keep saying on this program, radical don't mean that you must be stupid. I want some serious, sensible radicals here. Not stupidity radicals. Good evening. We have Takumo Ogunse. I think Vincent Alexander is going to be here with us. And we are going to be talking about the issues through the African Guyanese perspective. We're not giving up being African Guyanese. We're not giving up being Guyanese. We're not giving up being West Indian. We are all of those. Like I said, my Guyana, El Dorado, is a Guyana that includes all of us that, and that excludes none. 
I want a Guyana that includes Afro and Indo and Chinese and Portuguese and Amerindian and a few white people we got it. All of us must be included. When you watch the table, all of us must be sitting down there. All of us must be sitting down there. Nobody tell you why I want to sit on this Guyanese. What want to sit on is all the different Guyanese. That's the damn thing self. That's what makes this country sweet. And when you see an Indian man tell you, I want to get rid of race, what he want is he race to become the nation. And when an African man telling you, I don't want no Afro and Indo, what you want is he race to become the nation. I want Afro and you must want Afro. I want Indo and you must want Indo. I want Amerindian and you must want Amerindian and Chinese and Portuguese. And when we put all together, that is what become Guyana. Any Guyana that gets rid of Afro and gets rid of Indo and get rid of Portuguese and Chinese is a fake Guyana. Fake Guyana. I'm not fighting for Guyana that get rid of me. I'm fighting on a Guyana for a Guyana to include me. But I'm saying I ain't the only one. The Indian Babu brother, he got to be there with me. I'm a Chinese Chowling brother, sister, she got to be there with me. I mean, I'm an Indian brother, sister, they got to be there with me. The minute anybody tell you the Afro must go and the Indo must go, they're faking you, they line you, and they want to control you by getting rid of you. Good evening and welcome to Politics 101. The teachers have won the first day of collective bargaining. Thank God. Thank the ancestors. Thank the teachers. The teachers have got the government to agree to start talking about money from 2019 and not 2024. Who win? Who win? And the teachers have now said, as we move to Tuesday, we aren't taking single digits. We're not taking single digits. The teachers have put their story on the table. 25% for 2019, 20% for 2020, 21, 22, and 23. And you got a bargain. But the teachers already said, we ain't going single digits, so you better come from 10 going forward. <laughs> the teachers could big talk like that because they get the vagabonds to come to the table when they didn't want to come to the table. You see, when I teach the meaning of power, the definition of power to my students, I always teach them, and we always teach them, we political scientists, when we teach our students what is power, we say power is the ability to get people to do things that they would not normally do. Who got the power? Eh? Who made the teach, made the government come to the table when they didn't want to come to the table to recognize collective bargaining? The teachers. Who got the power and the glory? <laughs> Who got the government to agree that we got tag money from 2019? You are robbing me from 2019. You want to start in 2024 and rob me from two? The teacher said no. And what they agreed to? 2019. Who win? Who win? Who win? I want you all to learn this thing. This is how you evaluate reality. The teachers have won. And the teachers could not have won if they were not at the table. And they are at the table. And the teachers have said, here is the story. Here is the story. Don't come to me with no single digits. We said 25 and 20. And we are going below 10. 
Good evening and welcome to Politics 101. The Ganges has made the night. It's lovely. And we're going to walk this thing true to true, one by one. Because I don't want my people to be contrary. I don't want you all walking wrong the place when you all winning and say we losing. I don't want my people, according to Brother Bob, to be contrary. I don't want my people to be tricked by mercenaries. Brother, you're right. You're right. You're so right. I know in the heat of the moment. But I'm saying, watch we move in style. Watch the teachers move in style. We in the Working People's Alliance, the WPA, said we want to be at the table in any new dispensation because there are a couple of things we are form that we want to deliver to this country. We want to deliver universal basic income, which every Guyanese is required. And every Guyanese is guaranteed a universal basic basic income. You see like how Mark Light said, nothing below 10%. He's saying there must be a basic income for the teachers. We want a basic income for all workers. And we realize that if we're not sitting at the table, others may not be interested in that and push it. We got to be there to push it. And you all don't have to give us 90% of the votes. Give us enough percent of the votes so that we can be at the table. We want to guarantee you the, the oil money going to spend on infrastructure. We got to spend it on wages. We got to spend it on health care. We got to spend it on a whole bunch of things. But we also want to spend a small part of it on you directly. Give you to spend it on yourself. You see, infrastructure and wages and things, and know anything about the, 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 the leaking roof that you and your picnic are sleeping when the night comes. The WPA is concerned about that leaking roof. And so we want to give you some of the money so that you can fix your leaking roof. And we want to be at the table to do that. People have been asking me, Dr. Hines, are you running in 2025 and, and, thing, and so on and so on. And I don't want to get in front of the thing because we got fixed the election machinery and get that right. But once the election is called, yes, we are going to be competing in one form or the other to be at the table to deliver for you what we think that we are the only party that's interested in delivering to you. And we are a lot of people talking about education. And we are talking about a comprehensive education overhaul that begins with teachers' salaries that are competitive to begin with with our sisters and brothers in the Caribbean. Be, our teachers should be earning more because Guyana are getting more. And we want an education system in which illiteracy goes. goes. It's a crime to be illiterate in an oil-rich Guyana. Crime. 50% of our children are not functionally literate. Our dropout rate is about 40-50%. Working People's Alliance is saying those are the things we want to be on the table to put an end to. And so, yes, come to me in. Come to me in. And we're going to be doing it here. Welcome to Politics 101. I think our friends are ready. They're ready. So let's go. I think we have to come. Ogunse, Vincent Alexander, I noticed is here. Let me just get them in. We're ready to roll. Good evening, Brother Takuma. Hi, good evening, Dr. Hines, and good evening to your viewers. Good evening, uh, Vincent. Good evening, good evening Vincent. Good evening. Uh, Brother Takuma and Brother Vincent, we come tonight on air with the news that the teachers union, the education ministry agree to multi-year period for salary. The government wanted to start the period from 2020. The teachers wanted to start from 2029, sorry, 2019, 2019. 2019 and they have agreed to 2019. Um, 
uh, 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 and so that's uh, the latest news. I want you all to use that as your starting point to talk about the teacher strike. Of course, tonight we're talking from the standpoint of African Guyanese, but African Guyanese are indeed Guyanese. So as we talk about African Guyanese or from the African Guyanese standpoint, we're also talking from the Guyanese standpoint. Vincent, I'll start with you. Well, I would say that what we have heard so far is good news, but I would still be hoping that the teachers do not take their guards down, that they keep their guards up. They undoubtedly have an extremely good case. It's not a case of today, it's a case of yesterday. I have an extremely good case. I, I'm still exercising my mind as to what is it that has caused uh, the government to act with some apparent alacrity now, after weeks of resistance. So I'm, I'm still like, like I'm still looking to see how the ball on on pools. But certainly, uh, this is a sign of progress, and it is a tribute to the teachers that they took a stand. It's a tribute to the teachers that the union is properly organized. It's a tribute to the teachers that all of the rules which were tried that the president is not uh, eligible to be a president, that the strike is not a legal strike. All of these things, I would say, have not been to rest. And I would make the observation that what has really prevailed is the solidarity of the teachers on the ground. I think that it wasn't expected that they would able to stay the course they obviously stayed the course and in the face of that the government had no choice but to come to the table the government had no choice but to come to the table while well, takumo gunse um vincent has raised that question what has so dramatically changed as far as the government is concerned that um they are now acting with some alacrity. And I know you are a student student of dialectics. Um, uh, and so, therefore, you probably would put your dialectics um, knowledge to work here. Um, your, your comments on where the teachers are this evening. I think that the news is very welcome news. I think that um, we have to recognize that the teachers, through their militancy and struggle, and the action of Judge Kisun have had the effect of taming this runaway train and beating some amount of um, realism into the leadership of the PPP. I think it is the consequences of, of, of struggle. You see, many times we get confused with the rhetoric coming from both of the contending sides. And we hear the government will sell its narrative that is unmoving. The teacher strike is political. <clears throat> the teachers would not get this and would not get that. But the fact of the matter is, once there's a major confrontation in the society between the government and its employees, and in this case, an important part of the public service, which is the teachers, once that prolongs, it creates a lot of pressures in the system, which no government could ignore. And it opens up some vulnerability, both for the government and for the society. And at the end of the day, since we are a society that is governed <clears throat> by various um, sectors, you got judiciary, okay, and you, okay, as an important sector, the teachers have demonstrated once you put enough pressure in the system, other areas 
of, of, of the, the system, and in this case, the judiciary, have to kick in. And once that kick in, it takes away some of the control and the absolute power from the, from the government and the rulers and it open up the game. And I think this is what we have seen there. And I think that the, the lessons, I think that we as a nation, and more so since we're talking about African Guyanese, I think that the African Guyanese has to draw from the teacher's strike that you get nothing without a fight. And once you begin to fight, given the nature of the society, if they had to bow to just the teachers, which is a, a small section of the African Guyanese in resistance and in fighting for their rights, imagine if the entire African Guyanese began to fight for its rights. There is no way that we wouldn't get a solution. The PPP knows very well that it cannot continue in the old way once a significant section, the African Guyanese community begins to fight back. And, the, and, and, and our present dilemma is rooted in the fact that we have taken too long to fight back. We haven't drawn clear red lines. And I think that the teachers have learned and taught us a very important lesson going forward. You get nothing without the struggle. And once you begin to struggle, you open up a whole horizon which no side knows for certain where it will go. But what you know for sure, that given the nature of this society and given the nature of this regime, it cannot risk a total configuration of struggle in the country. And objectively, the own self-interest will force them to, to, to come to the table and to find some solution to problems. But to the extent that we don't push them in that direction, they continue the bullyism and they continue in the old ways. Brother Takumo Ogunse, I you forced me to, to, to draw on Frederick Douglass, uh, one of the original scholar activists in the African Guyanese community, born a slave, born a slave. He said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. And he also cautioned that there are people who want to reap the benefits of struggle without engaging in struggle. He also um, developed something which we in African-American politics called the threat of force. And he said when he was a little slave boy, one day the master approached him to beat him and he raised his hand to hit or to stop the master. And he said the master whip was suspended <laughs> in midair because the master did not expect the slave to fight back. And so the very threat of fighting back, even without using any force, he was able to change the dynamic between the slave master and the slave. And so we are learning here again, because sometimes new generations come in and they see the world from where they are. And so we have to learn and relearn the art of struggle. Vincent Alexander, I'm bringing you in on two things because you are, you are, you are I always think that you are at heart a, a, a lawyer. Um, what, what do you make of the intervention here of the judicial branch of government? Because it, for me, it's a significant intervention. Some people may even argue that it may the, the, the actions of the judge may have been not unconstitutional but extra constitutional. Some may argue. Some may argue that the gov the judge's action was not grounded so much in in legal legality but grounded in nationalism. The 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 the, the, the need to hold the nation together. So there are all these interpretations of what the judge did there, and I want to get your take on it. I also want to get your take on something that we political people, politicians, sometimes fall into. Ogun hinted at it. But we can't go on the road because if we go on the road, so's going to happen. We can't go on the road because if we go on the road, the PPP can put 
um, people in the marches and so on. So we can't go on the road. In effect, we can't struggle in a certain way. And we take it out of the equation. And then the first time we really go on the road in a serious way, boot up, boot up, boot up, boot up. Things fall in place. And the third thing I want you to comment on, Vincent, Mr. Lula. Uh, you know, I've been mentoring teachers through this, uh, through this um, strike. <laughs> and one thing the teachers keep asking me, Dr. Hines, all these overseas people that can't tell the government nothing, and I have to tell them, well, you know, there is something called um, non-interference in the affairs of other states, but there is also something called putting pressure on other states to act. And there's also something called a voice with the influence that will make a government not want to do what it did. Lula came, he saw, and he said a couple of things. He said, union workers in my country, get pay above inflation rate. He also said there is a way in which you have to marry spending on infrastructure and spending on human development. Vincent Alexander, I give you three things there, but I know you're able and cable. Well, first of all, we should observe and know that Lula is pro-labor. That is Lula's background. He's pro-labor. And he reminds me of one Winslow Carrington, who used to be the Minister of Labor, Labor a member of the PNC who told Borden in no uncertain terms, my first allegiance is the war courts. Do I win your party? My first allegiance is the war courts. Anytime there's a problem with the war courts, I'll be them in the first instance. Now, Lula, of course, he's not a Guyanese. But he's pro labor and his first allegiance is to the worker. I think he thought, took the opportunity from his world outlook to make statements that would send a message to the government of Guyana. And of course, given where Guyana is at, looking for recognition, looking for help, particularly with the Venezuelan problem and all of that. Then you couldn't just ignore what the pro labor man had to see. The man is sufficiently important regional and international actor that could make a difference that you had to take into consideration what he had to see. Now, the judicial element. Given that the strike was entering its fifth week, by then the government would have realized they had miscalculated. And therefore, they would have had to look to, in some regards, save face in terms of bringing the strike to an end on conditions that are favorable to the workers, but trying to argue, in fact, that they were the winners. And in fact, that's what the president sought to say. Yes. And look what has, what has happened. They have done what we were talking about all the time. Of course, the president got a lot of face. A lot of face. Because the fact of the matter is that it is the president, more than anyone else, who was not talking to the workers. Because the education sector had made it clear that the question of wages and salaries is not discussed at the level of the ministry. It's discussed at the level of the presidency. And therefore, the extent to which the president did not engage the workers is the extent to which the relationship had broken down in terms of collective bargaining for salaries and, and, and wages. And his attempt to call some selected people to state house, selected teachers, and to pretend that he had had a conversation with the teachers fell, fell flat because you have a union that is properly organized across the country, both in terms of its width 
and in terms of its depth. And in terms of its depth, the fact that the union sought to go to the court was a clear understanding that the union was reposing some confidence in the court system, not only because there was a court system to repose confidence in, but because they obviously felt that they had a very strong case. And that notwithstanding the problems you may have with the court system, that the court could hardly front on the case of the union. And I would say that the union in that regard has been vindicated. But I would also say that what occurred in the court takes us beyond what I consider to be a limitation of our judicial system, where many of our judges are positivists, yeah. and they do not take into consideration yeah. the social realities and doctrine, all of which the common law allows to be taken into consideration when they deliver in the judgment. Yeah. This judge here behaved like the CCC, CCJ judge who was a minority on one of these petition cases, where he said, look, you have to look at the social, political, and economic realities of Guyana when you're going to judge these matters. You can't simply come down the line of some literal interpretation yeah. of the law. I think this is what the judge has done, bearing in mind that our legal system has evolved to provide for mediation, and in so doing, that window was open, was open, and the judge sought to use that window. But certainly one has to commend the judge for his jurisprudential disposition. I wouldn't say he's extra-constitutional. I wouldn't say he's extra-legal. All I would say that he was a judge who went beyond the very narrow literary approach to law and would have taken doctrine and would have taken the social conditions. And one can argue that probably here is a case of probably sociological jurisprudence yes. uh, at work that caused the judge to come uh, to, that, to that conclusion. And, and so that the judicial system, in fact, is challenged by what this judge has done to itself embrace a, a wider and a deeper understanding of jurisprudence in the pursuit of justice and not just a literal understanding of the law. The question of the fear of protests being invaded by rogue elements. I, I don't think we can make a simple comparison between uh, the teachers' protests and uh, other protests which you might be referring to, national broad-based protests. Because one of the first things about the teachers' protest is that it was the teachers who were protesting. And the teachers know each other. And so there can be no pretenders in their protest. You're either with them or they know that you are not one of them. So that the conditions for persons to enter into the protests and to cause problems didn't necessarily exist in this circumstance because it was the, a protest of a sector where the actors knew each other and therefore could easily discern when there were forces trying to interfere with their action, to disrupt their action and to bring them into disrepute. Secondly, the teachers' protest was not centralized. It was localized. Let's assume some people attempted to break up the protest in Georgetown. That was not the teachers' protest. The teachers' protest was all that happened 
across the country. And so interference was not that easy because of the manner in which, the way in which the teachers union is organized. And so interference was not, was not that easy. And so whilst, what the lesson that we can learn, well, I think we know that, that you have to ensure people cannot uh, enter your protest with ulterior motives. That's a lesson I think which we know. It has played out in, in, in this circumstance and it challenges us to ensure that if there are other protests that we do not allow that kind of interference uh, in, in the process. But it is more challenging than the teacher protest would have been. Because in national protests, one looks for mass mobilization. And then here comes someone who pretends to be a part and is not a part uh, to disrupt the protest. The teacher's protest uh, was not conducive to that kind of intervention. That kind of intervention. And uh, Ogunse, I want to put the two questions for you because I think you've dealt with the judiciary already. I want to put the question of the um, the protest and taking protests out of the equation and uh, how that could work against you or not work against you. And uh, of course, I also uh, want you to uh, deal with the question of 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 the well, the, you dealt with the judiciary um, all, all already, um, but I also want you to deal with the third question that Vincent talked about there just now. I just want to say that Vincent's notion of the courts can be borne out by the Warren Court in the United States of America. Or Warren was a KKK member, former KKK member, named Chief Justice. And it was the Warren court that really presided over the final breaking down of segregation in the United States of America. And had he stuck to the letter of the law, we would not have gotten the end of segregation uh, and, and that he was prepared to go beyond that. And of course, we know um, uh, Thurgood Marshall's role on the court um, while he was there. But over to you, Ogunse, to deal with um, those two questions. The, the whole issue of the role of protests, and I'm talking about street protests, okay, has a, a long history. And the PPP, okay, has been able, particularly during the Desmond, coming out of the Desmond, how it led street protests, where I think it is in those protests that they use infiltration in a way that was never used before, okay, in a major way or in any consistent way in Guyanese politics. And let us, let us exclude the big crisis of the 60s. I'm not talking about the 60s when we had the racial riots and so I'm talking about protests, let me say post-independence. The PPP in the, in, the, in the Heights protests was able through the Dirty Tricks Department, okay, to find an effective way to criminalize and to create a negative view of PNC and by extension African protests by deliberately infiltrating African protests and attacking Indians and deliberately um, <clears throat> even outside of the protests but in the vicinity of the protests attacking Indians physically and their property and all is being blamed okay on the height protests the PNC protests the African protests and and that narrative have continued. And sections of the, P, the Indian society, both inside and outside the PPP, have added to that narrative 
and begin to sell to us as a country and as an African community that look, every time you go on the streets, it ends up that Indians being assaulted and Indian properties okay, are attacked. And it is not consistent with empirical evidence. But to, don't let us fight over the evidence at this point. Let us fight over the, 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 the narrative and what they were trying to do. They were trying to take away from Africans and to take away from Guyanese as a whole an important aspect of our history. We achieve independence in every social advancement, whether we're talking about the end of slavery, end of indenture, winning independence, trade unions, all of that took place in the context of mass resistance and struggle of Guyanese on the streets, regardless of race, color, or creed. That has been what have driven our advance in social, economic, and political shape. And if and any oppressor, Okay, we'll wish to take away that history from you because once they take away your history, okay, they make you weak. It's like a, 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 a colonizer. If he could take away your God and give, replace your God with his God or some other God, then he damage you and make you extremely weak. And in terms of politics, resistance and struggle is the God of politics with the masses. And if you take that away from them, then the masses are helpless. And that is what they have succeeded to do in Guyana. And a lot of our leaders buy into it. I remember engaging this matter. There is a reality that you can't avoid. No part of the world, when there's massive public protests, the organizers, are able to control what happened 100%. And societies have always, okay, find a balance, a balance. Any politician in London, in New York knows that once the political and social situation go beyond a point that people come into the streets, certain things will follow. But you, you, you don't ban protests simply because of that. You find a way of containing the negatives and you accept the logic of this kind of engagement could not be a perfect, peaceful, totally nonviolent um, activity. It is asking for the impossible. And that is where I start. Don't ask me for the political impossible. Because when I ask you for the political impossible, you can't deliver it. So let me be real. Okay, we all don't want protests and resistance to reach a point where there's unnecessary killings, there's unnecessary physical assault on people, unnecessary destruction of property. But don't tell me as a political or uh, activist, I organize them protests that you want me to be 100% responsible, okay, that nothing, okay, you could conceive as negative wouldn't happen. That's a non-starter. There's where I start. I, the second question, I, I'm not sure. Lula, Lula, Lula's intervention. Oh, yes, Lula. I think that Lula's intervention was deliberate. And I think I agree with both yourself and Vincent that Lula is a trade unionist, he's a trade union man, and that he could not have missed, okay, the moment, okay, to scold this runaway train, okay, that at the end of the day, Workers and working people interests are the permanent interests of any set of people who consider themselves progressive and a party who say at least there was or they began from Marxist working class orientation. And then for them, for them to now turn to workers in a situation of plenty where they spend trillions, a, a, a trillion dollar budget. And they have massive show of infrastructure, okay, development, and the turn to poor workers, in this case, teachers and public sector workers, and tell them that the government ain't got money to pay better wages and salaries. And I think Lula, recognizing 
the dilemma of the workers, bring the solidarity of the Brazilian state and his federation of trade unionists that he works with to, 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 in solidarity with the Guyanese teachers and extend, by extension, the Guyanese labor movement. And I think it was a fitting, it, it was the most politically important development that came at the period when we had these high level political people from CARICOM and the US. None of them saw it fit to do anything close to what Lula did. And I think that the Guyanese trade union movement and Guyanese workers, and by extension of our nation, will be internally all grateful to, to, to Lula, okay, for using his immense influence as an important regional and international figure, and more so an important and probably the, probably the most important Guyanese neighbor to tell the Jagdio Ali and the PPP, you have to turn, make a about turn, that that behavior is anti-working class, it is viciousness, and it has no place in progressive politics. Lula stripped the, the, them from any claim to be a progressive working class government. And I think that that is very, very important. Takumo Ogunse speaking there about the Lula's intervention. And you know, we have been doing it on this program night after night to say context matters. We don't expect you, the ordinary citizen out there, in your anxiety about where our country is going, to pull all the pieces together. And that is why we come on a program like this. Not because Vincent Alexander and Ogunse and Heinz know more than you. We don't. You, in many regards, know more than us. But what we try to do in your presence is to pull the pieces together so that you all can see them together. And that is why when people were annoyed or disappointed that some of our comrades were saying the teachers lost, I didn't panic because I knew what I was hearing was really a loss of confidence in the institutions of our country. And so even when the institutions were, in a sense, beginning to work in our favor, we hadn't put our minds around it yet because of that. I also recognize that part of the logic of what we do is, in a sense, to radicalize our own supporters and to have them raise their bar higher than it was last week and last month and last year. And in the process of doing that, sometimes your own supporters become more radical than you, <laughs> right? And so it's the logic of what we are doing. And I'm happy. I'm happy when I hear people say, the teacher should not have come off the road because it means that the radical instinct is coming to the fore. And it's our job then to say, yeah, but hold a minute, hold a minute, hold a minute. And if you all trust me, then you all throw back and listen. It's all part of the struggle. Vincent Alexander, I noticed a letter by you recently, two letters I noticed. One came, I would say minutes, an hour. Um, I was on a program uh, on Globespan last week, um, uh, along with um, Rochdale Ford, in a round of discussion that you yourself have been part of for the last year. And the question was about rigging elections. And our friend over there, Mr. Ravidev, concluded that Roysdale and myself, Roysdale and Hines, had one truth. And he and um, Beto Ram Ramarak had another truth. And that rubbed you the wrong way. I, I went into my inbox and there was your letter as if as if it was written before, before you heard them. <laughs> and then I saw another letter from you today in which you were talking about the voters. Let's collapse the two together and talk to us. All right, before, before I do that, allow me one extra word on the teaching situation. Sure. I, I think we also have to recognize the astuteness 
of the leadership. And that was a contributing factor. There are a number of contributing factors. All might not be mentioned, but the strictness of the leadership is important. Strike breaking sometimes has to do with uh, driving fear into the workers that they would lose their jobs, they wouldn't get pay, and things like that. And so when the leadership went to court, they sought to cover that flank in the first instance. And they got a ruling, albeit temporary, which allowed their, their membership the kind of comfort to continue the struggle. It takes some of the pressure off of them to say, you know, we ensure we get paid, we ensure we get knock up, and things like that. And so the way in which the leadership executed this, this, this strike and the various mechanisms to keep it going it should also be recognized. I just thought I would make that, that, that comment uh, as well. Now, <laughs> I, I watched that program and, and I saw the attempt being made to, to completely discredit the contentions of Rosalind Ford. I saw the attempt being made to kind of co-opt him, co-opt him and say, look, be, be a good boy and therefore agree to what we are saying. Mm -hmm. When you don't agree to what we are saying, we're going to scold you. But the fact of the matter is what he was saying was correct, it was right, and was relevant. GCOM is the custodian of all of those documents submitted by the APNU AFC requesting that they be verified to determine the extent to which there was voter impersonation. And that those documents consist of thousands of names in an election where the difference is a mere 14,000. So you only need to find about 7,000, you know, to make a difference in, in, in mathematical terms. And that's the point that Rosdale was making. It's a pertinent point and one that people would not wish to see on the table. And it has to be made because it is what, in fact, occurred. And so this question of saying, well, you know, the PVP might do a little rigging here and are there, but the PNC is the biggest riggers. Mm -hmm. And then attempt to cover up, to cover up instances where the PPP and, and who they have within GCOM uh, have sought to blindfold Guyanese about what really occurred has to be exposed for what it is worth has to be exposed and it's in that context that I, I thought that here i should come forward and not have uh someone who has a true case a potent case be belittled because what we're really trying to do is to belittle was the food in, in some regards, it's like attacking the messenger so that the message goes nowhere. And this, this now has happened just about a week before. Jacob itself has now come forward and said, we have a new voters list. And the number of people in that voters list is 200, 700 and six, 439, I think. That's the number of people in the voters list. In a country where we have a population of 780, thereabout, with a school population of 200,000, uh, thereabout, and therefore, a resident population of approximately 500 and something, who should be on the voters list? But lo and behold, we have a voters list with 706. And then people argue, well, 
the 706 people in the voters list are all Guyanese who are registered and the judge says you can't take them off. So what's wrong with the list? Well, what's wrong with the list is this. That the documents that Ford talked about represents evidence of the fact that names on the list were voted for although persons were not present. So to have a list with extra names is problematic. And don't tell me that people have in right to be on the list because there are tens of thousands of overseas Guyanese who have died who are on that list. So even if we observe the judge's ruling that you can't take live people off the list, what are we doing about the dead people overseas? What are we doing about them? In the circumstance where we have evidence that absentee people have been voted for, the GCOM acquired the documents which Nandalal and everybody was, was referred to. They acquired those documents. They sent them to the chief immigration officer. And of the small number which was sent, because GCOM didn't send all, thousands were kept back. 80% of the names proved to be persons who were out of the country. So when Nandala go on the radio and tell people, well, this is falsification because some of the people turned up, the immigration people presented a report which says, yes, some could turn up. But we have verified 80% can't turn up. And therefore, there is a problem with our electoral system that facilitates impersonation, and which obviously impacts the results of the elections. And I'm not arguing here for a result one way or the other. I'm arguing for a system that is fair and for free and fair elections. And you know what? All of the thousands of those claims in relation to people who were voted for, that GCOM did not send forward, Nandalal in August of 2022 waged a war to put his hands on those documents. Mm -hmm. And when he was waging that war, he said he was waging the war so he can get the documents to show and the AP and UAFC was up to mischief in the submission of those names. We are now in March of 2024, and Nandalal, who has access to the immigration people and everybody else to do the verification, a verification which was done of 500 and something, has gone patently silent, patently silent. He has not come forward to disprove the accusations, the allegation of the AP and UAFC that there were scores, hundreds, and thousands of persons who were not in the country for whom votes was cast. He has not done that. But he's relying on this sidebar of Mingo and all of that to occupy the minds of people. Why is it in fact there is evidence that needs to be addressed. And not only addressed in terms of 2020, addressed in terms of the possibilities going forward. You know, that letter which you saw in, in the social media today was written last night. And I myself was surprised it surfaced that quickly. And if you went on to certain WhatsApp pages today, all the cockroaches came out. Mm -hmm. All of them came out. None of them who came out could argue that the facts that I had put into the public domain were not correct. But all of them sought to attack me. And I am not credible and therefore don't listen to me. In other words, they cannot they cannot prove otherwise. 
And so they are making every effort to ensure that people pay absolutely no attention to the facts of the matter. And the facts of the matter include after the 2020 elections, there are some of us at GCOM who called for an evaluation of the elections so we could determine areas in which there were weaknesses and flaws, not to give a party victory, but to ensure that we perfect our system. And GCOM blatantly refused an evaluation. It's unbelievable that an organization will have a project and at the end of the project, refuse an evaluation. But in this instance, the refusal is contextualized. The evaluation will throw up information, which we knew exists, but which we wanted to use for the perfection of the system. But they are faithful that the evaluation will not only give information to perfect the system, it will give the nation to point fingers as the way in which our electoral system has been manipulated. That brings me to this whole question of how dysfunctional our electoral system is, not only from that perspective, but, but from the perspective of a plural society and a majority take all kind of, of politics. So David, we are at a situation in this country where it is clearly evident that the electoral system can be misused. And where when we call for mechanisms like biometrics, which doesn't take anybody's name off the list, but what it does is allows a voter to go to the place of poll and be identified by one of the best identifiers that we know, that is a physical feature, the fingerprint, there are people who are against it. And they must have an interest in being against that. And the interest is evident in what occurred in 2020. We're in for a rough ride. We cannot allow this country to proceed to another elections, not putting in place mechanisms to mitigate the misuse of the dead people's names on the list. Because I will narrow it down simply to the tens of thousands who have died overseas and the thousands who have been sent for verification, which nonetheless has probably put in some cold storage. But the fact of the matter is that the first set of verified uh, documents showed that 80% there were some 500 and something people names which were sent, and 80% were verified to have been people who were not in the country. We have to address that. If we don't address that, all who do not address that are complicit, complicit, complicit in creating the circumstances, if not themselves being involved in corrupting our elections. Vincent Alexander, Takuma Gunse. Rigging is in the air again, the conversation, and as usual, um, different forces are framing the issue from their standpoint. What says thou? This is all, matter. And what I'm concerned with is that our present political leaders and activists on the opposition side is playing into the PPP's game plan. There will never be a meeting of minds based on discourse between the PPP, okay, the government and the opposition on this question of having a fair and free elections and elections free from fear. We have seen, and Vincent is there, I don't want to spend time on things that Vincent are more, you know, <coughs> okay than me in development some GCOM. GCOM now is the most partisan election commission that we, we, had, we have had for many, many years. And I'm saying that the opposition is wasting time. I'm not saying we shouldn't spend some time, you know, dealing with some of the issues and the presiding evidence. But I think we spend too much energy there. 
We have to go to the juggler. We have we have to go to the juggler. The voters list will not change, okay, unless the opposition is prepared to make a major fight, okay, for change, and and and, and is prepared not to contest another election on the that on the uh, with that voters list. And to the extent that they're not prepared to do that, and to the extent that they participate in the, in the elections under the list, then they are just as guilty as the government. And I want the discourse to shift from, from rigging. We know the, the problems of rigging this country. We know we want to stop it. And if we identify the voter list as an important um, element in this equation, we fix the problem. If we refuse to fix the problem as a nation, then shut me out about the election again. Just live with it. And that is my approach to, 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 to election again. I don't want the discussion. We have had, I have gone through that discussion from the age of 16. I 72. I see all, you know, all aspects of that development. And it's still with us today. We we have to fix it, not spend time on arguing whether it exists and who this and who the. Fix it and, and fixing it start with, for me, with the voters list. Fixing it start with ending the winner take all governance. Because all of that is tied up into rigging elections. And to the extent that we don't want to, as a nation, don't want to fix those two things, then we should just live with the consequences of our own nice actions. We are a country that likes to have rigged elections. So, Ogunse, you say fix it. But clearly, the opposition has said, we are ready to fix that voters list. We are ready to have new house registration, put a new list together. And it is the PPP that is opposed to that. So what when you say fix it, what are you talking about? Opposition closed the country down on the matter. Oh, you're talking. Are you talking, talking, talking? We're talking from since I was a little boy. All right, all right. You're we don't understand the limits of talk. Right. When the problem reaches a certain point, we okay, we have to know you have the opposition if you want to be credible. It has to back that. Yeah. But with action, bring you people into the streets. Make it clear to the rulers that this will not be a normal country if this thing don't fix. Well, then we, you build an effective opposition. If the opposition agrees with your view, I hope they're listening. And at the next board meeting, they put it on board. That is, Vincent is a commissioner. Clearly, that is not his, it is, it is not his mandate. Um, his mandate is to do the kind of talking that he's, he's talking about there. And that is to put that thing into the open. I think I am... Um, um, sympathetic because a few of us have been trying for the last three years to say that the elections of 2020 was massively rigged by the PPP. And we have not been allowed by the media, we have not been allowed, of course, by the PPP for that narrative to come to the fore. To close the country down on an issue, you have to have the country around the issue. And I think we still have a lot of work to do to really convince even opposition supporters of the massive rigging of the PPP. The PPP, as you have said, they have done... Um, a they have, they have... Oh, let me finish. They have done a clever job at putting the narrative on their side. And the program that, that, that um, Roysdale and I were on, they were trying to trap us into giving Reagan a, a political party face, an ethnic face, and we resisted that to the point where one of them said, well, you know, the PPP will try a thing. You, you, under normal circumstances, they wouldn't even say that. But because we stuck to our guns, we, have to, we still have to convince our people that the PPP rigged the hell out of that 2020 election. And so, therefore, I think there is still some talking to be done. But anyhow, you wanted to rebut that. I, I just wanted to make the point <clears throat> that African, the majority of African Guyanese are of the view that the PPP rigged the elections. You'll never get 100% anything. And I'm telling you, 
a large number of Indians also know the people with the election because they participate. There are no people of their own kind of participating in the region. This is not a small country. These days are no secrets. The, 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 the issue, we got to be clear, we will never ever come, okay, to a common ground between the PPP and the, and the opposition and the and government and the opposition on this matter. We will never come to a common ground 100% between the African community and the Indian community on this matter. Okay? So we, we have to live with that. So we 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 in this naked, we in this naked engagement of power politics. The government is using everything that they has as a as a government, all the tools to prevail. The opposition has to turn and use all the tools they had have at their disposal to prevail. That is how you come to balance the, the situation. And if you believe. If look, we mustn't make the mistake that because if if the opposition in call out his supporters to battle, would you expect the people gonna show battle readiness and willing to engage? You tell me, look after my life, you know, and wait till 2025, I got how much to, uh, a year more, uh, 18 months or uh, whatever. Whoa, whoa. But the day the opposition call the, the, the forces to, to, to battle, it will change the whole engagement of how people see issues. And, and this is all I'm trying to, to, to say, is that we are in an engagement where the state, those who control the state, is using all the, 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 the tools they have in their toolbox as, as rulers. The opposition is not using all the tools that they have in their toolbox as an opposition. And that is the dilemma we have. Vincent Alexander, you have the last say tonight on this matter. Well, you may notice, David, that um, my position in the political landscape may be seen as a GCOM commissioner, but it may be also seen as a civic actor, as chairman of the Bornham Foundation. The Bornham Foundation, in creating the life of Bornham, recognizing the talks he had with the PPP in the 70s and in the 80s, recognizing that we are all in one boat, came up with this idea that if we take this country back to ground zero, in other words, if we put aside all these shenanigans, who ring, who we ring, who gets foreign assistance, and all of those shenanigans, and go back to ground zero, where we have these two parties bringing together the people of different descents, in the context where our economic policies, policies, not execution, are not significantly different, then we stand a chance of being able to build the Guyana, which we articulate we want it to be. However, there's been little, for example, the PVP hasn't said a word on that proposition. Rather than paying attention to that, they hone in on a speech, a contribution made from the floor by Elder Green. But the crux of what we have proposed is to get this country back to ground zero. Going back to ground zero only requires the will. Only requires the will. And we can build back from ground zero, taking into consideration the challenges, the electoral system, all of the other challenges, but putting the shenanigans apart and observing that it is decades ago that Kwanda says there is no guilty party. Nigel, using this presentation, says we are all guilty. The truth of the matter is that we have a basis on which we can put all of that aside, get back to ground zero, and try to build a country for which we now have required resources for building. Required resources to build in. Vincent Alexander, I'm going to ask you a question now. You can refuse to answer it if you're not ready to answer it. Um, uh, looking at where GCOM is today, looking at that voters list that GCOM has come up with, can GCOM deliver credible elections within the next year? 
GCOM will be hard put, given the things that they need to do. Minimum for me is the implementation of the biometric means will be hard put uh, to do so. There are some mechanisms that can be used uh, temporarily. For example, in the 2015 elections, when the Carter Center came, I read a proposition, simple proposition, that if you use the voters list in its, in its current form, that you get the information from immigration, all the people who have not returned, and to highlight those names on the list. Mm -hmm. So there could be greater vigilance by the party activists and so and, and as a temporary measure. So for me, one has to be innovative and imaginative and, and to find uh, short-term approaches given the time frame we face with. Uh, ultimately, we know what we want, but I do not see GCOM as having the will and the commitment to do anything different. And it will require the kind of struggle that we saw come from the teachers if there is going to be any change in the way in which GCOM conducts its affairs. GCOM is a four three mechanism. A four three mechanism. We saw I saw a beautiful opening the other day where we actually had a situation where four persons agreed on the matter. Two did not agree. The chairman had not said anything at that time. The chairman came back a week after and ruled as if there wasn't a situation for two. Mm -hmm. Ruled in favor of the two. And we were able to push back on that. The following week, the following week, the fourth party came back and withdrew his support. And so we got back to a tree, a tree tree situation. Wow. There's little hope. There's little hope for the configured GCO to make a difference to this country. We need Gong Zero. And when we get a Gong Zero, one of the things to change is GCO. GCOM itself, Vincent Alexander saying that uh, GCOM does not have the capacity, he's not optimistic. And both Alexander and Ogunze have agreed that it will take the kind of struggle like the teacher's struggle to get us um, a, a political solution at GCOM. I want to throw my support behind that. I think struggle should be permanent, should be permanent. I think that as an opposition, you must always find a way to keep the struggle hot, whether it's on the streets, whether it's in the National Assembly, wherever it is to keep the struggle hot. Keep the struggle hot. The struggle must be permanent. Resistance must be permanent. If you take resistance away, then you are talking about unaccountable government. And so here we are, sisters and brothers. Um, there you have it, another edition of Politics 101. Tonight we have been looking at it from the perspective of African Guyanese. But you notice, uh, even when we are looking at it from the perspective of African Guyanese, we can't help but doing so within the context of um, the nation. Um, Ogunse, thank you very much. Vincent, thank you very much. I will see you guys back next week. Thank you. And uh, yes, tomorrow night, we are back again. We are back again. We come off air tonight with the good news that the teachers have got the government to agree that the time frame for the discussion of wages starts in 2019 and not 2024. Two mornings ago, I said the language of the agreement that they came up with under the mediation of Justice Toby and Justice Loku, that language was a compromise language. That, 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 that you got in there 
reasonable time when the PPP didn't want put no time frame. So we are saying reasonable time wasn't good, but the re reasonable time only got in there because the teachers insisted on it. The, the, the government didn't want no time. No time frame. And so what is happening here tonight is that we are saying to you, the government wanted 2024. The teachers wanted 2019. The teachers got 2019. So we now know that the teachers win and because we know what the government wanted. I think with that agreement, the teachers union was not quick enough to tell us what the government actually wanted and how they had to fight to get the kind of agreement that was um, gotten there. And I think we are still learning this thing about political communication. We are still learning it in this new era of social media where people are picking up things very quickly. And those of us who are communicate, communicating are still learning the process of political communication. That if you tell your people, you got to point, you get you got seven out of ten because you insisted when the government wanted one out of ten, you were able to get seven out of ten. When the government wanted one out of ten. If your people know that your seven is six plus where the government wanted to be, they're more sympathetic. But when they see seven, they say it's seven out of ten. They're not realizing that the government wanted one out of ten. You all understand? So it is our leadership has to communicate more with you all. That is why when some of you said the teachers lost, I didn't jump on you all. I didn't jump because I understand where you're coming from. When you see they put in that thing, including finances, the PPP didn't want that in the agreement because including finances mean including wages. The PPP was happy to go and sit down and talk about some of the other things. They didn't want to talk about wages. They didn't want that in the agreement. And that is why when you see including finances, the PPP never wanted that. And when you know what's happening in the background, then you understand where you're winning. It is what the other side wanted and they didn't get in. Today we know the other side wanted to start, tell those teachers about 2020. They want to rob the teachers from 19, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. They want five years to be left alone. And the teachers insisted. The teachers union has thrown the gauntlet down. They're not accepting anything, anything below 10%, no single digit. They have drawn a line in the sand. That's what we talk, when we talk about struggle and we talk about militancy, that is militancy. The teachers are asking for 25% for 2019 and 20% from 2020 to 2023. Those of us who know something about collective bargaining, know that you don't always get, the workers don't always get all they ask for. But in this case, the workers are saying clearly, nothing below 10% is going to is going to fly. It's going to fly. It's going to fly. And I think they've made it clear. Political communication is important. And with all due respect, I think people like myself have a role to play in that regard to try to communicate to you all the context, the background, the subtext. Because sometimes the actors involved don't do that. It was so happy to see the composition of the teacher's team, to see the president was there, the general secretary uh, uh, was there, Vanessa Kisun was there, Collis Nicholson was there. Because when people didn't see Coretta, during the negotiations under the mediation of justices Stobie and Loku, they were beginning to say, oh, the, the, the teachers union has muzzled Coretta. She, she's a loose cannon, so they didn't carry her and so on. And the government was celebrating because they don't want to deal with the, 
with the Coretta McDonald's of this world. What is good is that the teachers have the full gamma there. Coretta is who she is. That's the way she, that's her political tradition. If they won't call her a firebrand, they won't call her a militant, there is, there is room for militant and firebrands. If they say that Mark Light is much more moderate, there is room for moderates too. And what it shows is that the leadership of the teachers represent the gamut of thought, the gamut of perspective. Not all teachers are militant. Not all teachers are moderate. Some teachers are very conservative. But you have the range there. And that is what is important. You have the rainbow. And it's good to see Coretta and Mark Light and Vanessa and Collis Nicholson. Collis is a young man I know very well. I watch him grow up in Buxton. And, and, and so on, so I know him very well. And uh, he, he's, not, he's not a party political man. He's, he's a generally, generally uh, uh, a community person, you know. Um, uh, and, and, and so I know he doesn't go there with a party agenda, but he's a young man that, uh, that thinks, takes very seriously the teaching profession. He don't play with that. And it was good to see him become a trade unionist. And I can tell you, is a young man who has the interests of the teachers. So I'm glad that despite differences on how this thing should have played out in the end, that the teachers are holding one head. You don't come this far to this unite. Differences, there will always be. You be you, me be me, and that's the damn thing that make our country so sweet. So all hail to the teachers. All hail to the teachers. Yes, Coretta, speak for in the language that some of us would speak. Brother Mark may not speak in the same language, but at the end of the day, the objective is the same. And we got to stand behind the teachers' union because they are, are, are I've really put out there a blueprint as to how we are going to forward in this dispensation. I love the teachers. I'm a teacher too myself. I always remember that I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher and I stand with teachers. As I said, we want to be at the table and I want to say this, I'm gonna say it regularly. There are things that we want. By we, I mean the party that I belong to. I don't always make my show a platform for my party. I bring people in from all parties. But I want to say the party that I belong to, the Working People's Alliance, we want to be at the table because there are things that we feel that only we can push for and deliver to you. A universal basic income is important. What the teachers are asking for is a universal basic income. Where all workers are guaranteed a basic income that is linked to a livable wage. And we are saying that monies can be spent on all the things, infrastructure, salary, health, building hospital, building bridges, and all of those things the money can be spent on. But part of the money has to be given directly to you, for you to spend for yourself, because there are things that the government will not never know and can never take, it, take care of. The leak in the roof, the money to start a small business. The government is not taking care of that. It is through cash transfer, where we are saying take 10% of the takings of the oil and divide it among the 220 or so households in Guyana. And let us be guaranteed each year our direct share so that we can spend it or we want to spend it. The government can build the roads in front of the house, but the government is not going to fix the leak in the house. The government will build the roads in the house. The government will pay the teachers a better salary. But to get that extra room in the house because there are now five children 
instead of two children. Only the teacher as a parent can do that. And the teacher can do that on her salary. And so they supplement the, the universal basic income. The, the, the cash transfer is a supplement. So we in the WP are saying, pay the teachers a livable wage. And then on top of that, supplement their income with a cash transfer. And we feel that we have to be at the table. We have tried to convince our sisters and brothers that that is something to invest in. Some of them has, have said yes. Some of them have been lukewarm about it. And we are convinced that for it, for it to happen, we have to be at the table. We, the WP, have to be at the table. And so in that regard, we are running. But we are saying, as Vincent Alexander Ogunse said earlier, the electoral machinery got to be fixed. They got to be fixed. This is not about elections. This is about the elections being a means towards an end, a desirable end. But we are saying the issue of direct cash in people's hands. You saw yesterday a whole set of people, including black people. Somebody put out some hoax that they're sharing money at Freedom House. Hundreds of them turn up there looking for cash grant from Freedom House. I'm saying to them, look, put your support behind us. So you, cash, you don't got to go in front of Freedom House like begging like dog for cash grant. Give us your support so that we can get into government where your cash grants will be coming directly to your account. You don't got to go and prostitute yourself in front of Freedom House. You want cash grant. We understand that. And there is a party, there is a group of people who are fighting for that. Professor Thomas put that on the table since 2018. So rather than go and make yourself a jackass in front of Freedom House, rally behind your leaders and your parties and fight for that cash grant. Because when, if you put us in government, we're not going to have you come in front of Freedom House, stand up and beg in. Your cash grant will be coming direct to your account. And so rather than put your energies for people making you look like a fool, going in front of Freedom House, standing up like beggars, put that energy towards supporting us. We're saying cash grant must be law. That's where our priorities have to be. And like I said, I, I don't turn the program into a party program, but I ask tonight for this little space to say the WPA is a party. We don't have all the answers. We are not experts on anything, but there are two things for now that we are interested in. The universal basic, basic income and cash transfer and education. And when we talk about education, we're not talking about piecemeal. We are acknowledging Acknowledging that you can't be a functional economy with 50% illiteracy. You can't be a functional country and call yourself a first world country with 40 to 50% dropout rate of your children. You can't. And that is what we have to fix. And the first thing you do in fixing that is pay your teachers better. If you pay your teachers better, one of the first things you do is you attract some of your best children coming out of school to the teaching profession. If you pay, a lot of people like to teach, want to teach, but not getting into teaching because teaching don't pay. So to get your best people into teaching, we have to pay better salaries. And for those who decide, despite the bad pay, they are still going to teach. We have to keep them from going to Barbados and, and, and Bahamas and New York. 
And the way you keep them is bring their wages up to speed with Bahamas and, 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 and St. Martin and Barbados and Grenada. And the WPA is committed to that. And we have to be at the table to make sure that happens. And we have to train our teachers. We have to make our teachers what teachers are. Teachers are, teachers are people who, who know everything. You, you, when you're teaching at the primary school level, you got to teach all the subjects. You got to teach English, you got to teach math, you got to teach social studies, you got to teach everything. And you have to be properly trained. Always be trained. The WPA said there is time for a state of emergency in our education system back to ground zero. And we start all over. We got to get education right. We have to get education right. If we get roads right and we don't have education right, we are in trouble. If we get hospitals right and don't get education right, we're in trouble. We have to strike the balance. And we are saying all of us have to lift our share. And we say we're taking on education because we think that it's an area. Rather than have our children running after school in the afternoon, in the morning they wake up, they go into lesson. Then they go to school during the day, they got to sleep in school. And then after school, they go into lesson. That time that they're spending in lesson after school, they ought to be playing sports. They ought to be in their drama groups. They're singing groups. Because leisure is important. I always point to my cousin. He's now in Linden or in Gordon. A lot of you all know him. He was once the, 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 the mayor there and the CEO. Bright, like, like a bulb. But he's also... He was one, if not our best cricketer. He, he put the amp on table tennis. He was a champion of that. I don't think he played much football. I think he played around with it and so on. Drama, he was in it. A point I am making that these all wrong talents, these all wrong talents is what we want our children to be. They must be bright in academics, but they must also play sports. They must engage in art. They must engage in science. That's where we have to go. But we first of all have to pay our teachers a livable wage so that we can attract more good citizens to teaching. And those who are already in the teaching profession, we make them want to stay in Guyana want to stay in the teaching profession. If they're going to Bahamas, pay them what they're paying them in Bahamas. Because if I, if a teacher get 1,500 US dollars in the Bahamas and 1,500 US dollars in Guyana, that teacher will prefer to stay in Guyana and teach than go to the Bahamas. I bet the bottom dollar. Because you ain't gonna get no insult that you ain't belonging. But if you paying them 600 US, and Bahamas paying them 1,500 US, they're gonna go to Bahamas, take the insult because they're getting 1,500 US. We are saying, we, 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 all of us have to be at the table to deliver for you. One of the criticisms of the last government, the coalition government, is that it delivered things, but it never delivered it in a way to make its supporters feel that you're delivering to them. We must not make that mistake again. The challenge is to deliver for all of Guyana. And in the process, deliver for your supporters. There are things that Indian Guyanese need more than African Guyanese. And there are things that Amerindians need more than coastlanders. And we have to be able to deliver to everyone. And we are saying cash transfer to all of soul, regardless of race. 
a functional education system for all Guyanese, regardless of race. That is what we mean by multiracialism, not to see an Indian face and an African face. That's not multiracialism. That's a show. Multiracialism is when your policies bring equity and equitability among the different groups in the society. And we feel that we have to be at the table to do that. So those of you who've been asking us about whether we WP is participating in the election, you know, it's a double-edged sword because if we say yes, we participate in the election, then you may get the impression that we participate in an election that's rigged beforehand. We are committed to fighting to get a, the freest election, but we are also committed to being part of the group that is elected to government. And we have saying that there are two or three or four things that we are going there to deliver to you all. And that if we are not there, it would not be delivered to you all. That's, that's what I'm saying. We have cash transfer has been on the table. Some people have embraced it. Some people have been lukewarm about it. But we are saying we are the ones who have to carry it to the end. And we want to be at the table in government to deliver that to you. We said 5,000 US dollars six years ago. The calculation is being done now, and it's no more than 5,000 US dollars. So there we are, brothers and sisters. We are in this thing together. We have, we have a lot on our plate, and um, I am sure that we're going to get there. Good night to be a teacher. Good day to be a teacher. Thanks to the teachers, the teachers have led the way. The teachers have led the way. I love you all. And tomorrow night, we are going to be back here. Same time, same place. The struggle goes on. If you hear black is beautiful. Santa Claus. Black is beautiful. It's a texture. Lift your hand like me. You've got to win.